Hi, everybody. We're back. This is Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org. My co-host today, Paul Gillen, who I'd like to thank, uh, had to leave, but he was fantastic. So I uh, really appreciate his, uh, his attendance here on theCUBE. He was a CUBE newbie, but you never would have known it. This is theCUBE, and we're here at the MIT Information Quality Symposium. We've been here for two days. This is, we're at the tail end now, and, uh, but we've got a very high energy guest. Micheline Casey is here. She's the Chief Data Officer of the Federal Reserve. Micheline, great to have you on theCUBE. Thanks for coming by. Thanks, Dave, appreciate it. Yeah, so uh, you were the first Chief Data Officer uh, at the state level, yes. at the state of Colorado, the yes. first Chief Data Officer at uh, the Federal Reserve. Yes. What makes a good chief data officer? What are the characteristics of a chief data officer that we should look for? Um, well, I think there's a combination of skills. I think strategic leadership is certainly one of those things. Someone who's been in the data world, in the high tech world, um, that's important as well. Um, but also people who are used to dealing with political situations. Um, traditionally, data has been siloed off and um, you we're, we're at this point where chief data officers are, are really silo busters in a number of ways and chief diplomatic officers and, and having to span um, and cross lines of business and bring cross-functional people together to really leverage and optimize data in ways that it hasn't been done before. So um, I spend a lot of my time actually um, on the communication side, on marketing and strategy and figuring out you know, what, what the service portfolio of our group really needs to be relative to um, the board's mission and strategy and how we leverage data and optimize data in support of board mission. Um, but even at the state government le level, um, being able to blend the data strategy and, and tie that and align that to um, mission strategy is, is really important. So someone who's a, a good strategic thinker um, and can work with the C-level executives across the organization to really understand what the goals and missions um, and objectives of the organization are. So organizational dynamics, obviously, communications, uh, strategy. Did you have a background in organizational dynamics in any way, shape, or form, or was you just sort of natural at it? Or no, it's something I've, I've been <laughs> <laughs> observing over, uh, over a number of years. I've worked in a lot of different types of organizations, actually, small companies, um, four startups, um, very large organizations like IBM Global Services, um, and, and so just, I, I think to me as sort of an observational person, um, the structure of an organization can really support or impact um, and hold back work that needs to be done, and, and um, I think it's a, an important topic that is under discussed in, in the conversation around CDO. It's so true, I mean, the organizations can either be an inhibitor or an accelerator, and it's, and it's sometimes hard to figure out how to, how to approach that. Uh, change, culture change and, and the culture of an organization is also, you know, in, in a similar model, and, and organizations really being able to embrace um, a different mindset around managing data. Um, uh, so I spend a lot of, of time thinking about that and, and executing, trying to execute against that. So let's talk a little of, you know, practical experience. So when, when did you join the state of Colorado as a CDO? In, well, I joined the state in 2007, and I actually was the director of identity management for okay. the state. Um, and then in 2008, the uh, legislature passed uh, a law, <laughs> um, the first one that, that we did around better improved data management. They, they were having challenges and the governor was having challenges in understanding um, and getting answers about key business um, uh, data sets around um, number of employees we had, number of citizens we were serving, number of vehicles in our fleet uh, as examples. Um, and they wanted to have better data uh, to improve policy making, to improve financial decisions. Um, and they recognized that we, we could be doing a much better job of managing data, sharing data, exchanging data um, to improve outcomes for not only our citizens, but the businesses that we're supporting in the state Okay, of so that was which, which year? Uh, 2008. That was eight, okay. 2008. So, so went from sort of identity management right into the fire. Of well, I actually held, held both roles for oh the okay, remainder so of my tenure, yeah. Okay, and I'm, I'm sure you got a big raise for that. <laughs> so, <No. laughs> um, what were your first hundred days like? Uh, this is the first time you were a, a CDO, right? Um, at the state of Colorado. Yeah, yeah right. Was that is that correct? You weren't a CDO. I was not that, right? a, a chief data officer prior to that. No. Right. Okay. So, so your yeah. first role, first time you're a CDO, 
they're like, okay, this is new. Yeah. There weren't a, a lot of, there still aren't a lot of CDOs around. So what were your first 100 days like? Not, not a lot of role models. Um, well, we were actually executing against a piece of legislation that um, was around information sharing and information exchange in the state. So um, one of the first things I did was actually pull together a cross-functional team that was representative of the majority of um, the state agencies that we had. And we started building a plan that tracked along three angles. First of all, trying to inventory the data that we did have, trying to understand how information was and wasn't being shared across the organization, um, and, and getting our arms around policies and processes that may or may not be in place to support that. So a baseline. Where we're, are we? we're, we're baselining yeah. um, and also gathering information about what could be possible if we were managing our information. So better. try to understand your constraints, Maybe constraints, some uh, you know, out of scope expectations, where we wanted to get to, um, and and what the future state could look like, and having okay. those conversations as part of, we're here, we need to go there. What does that roadmap? So look that was like? part of step one. That was part of okay, step great. one. Okay. And we subsequently passed three laws after that around um, data and information management. We actually um, the second law we passed put our uh, Enterprise Governance Council in legislation. We wanted to make sure that it would span administration changes. Mm -hmm. So instead of doing an executive order, we, we chose to go through the legislative route and had phenomenal bipartisan support um, from uh, our partners in the state legislature um, and then passed a couple of other laws after that. So I'm gonna make sure I didn't miss it. I, I think I heard you say that you, you, when you, you know, started out, you really focused on three areas, mm -hmm. which I call baselining, and you said that part of that was the, the future state and what you could actually achieve. Yeah. What, what else was part of that three? Um, organizationally understanding who we needed to have in order to operate and implement. Um, so our, our approach was generally um, understanding where we, we needed to go, but what the current state needed to look like operationally, who we needed to have as part of a, an implementational team, um, and then thirdly, um, getting our arms around the policies and processes we would need to support that. Okay, and then just to, for others who are thinking about doing something like this, we heard Datran say it's not a project, and I know I'm speaking almost like in project terms, but you gotta get started. You gotta get started um, and, somewhere. And, and these three things, the baselining, understanding the organizational requirements, and the policies that you need to put in place, it sounds like a reasonable thing to do. How long did that take just to get your arms around that before you could actually start the journey? Um, we, we took the better part of uh, a good year, mm -hmm. um, six months actually to do the beginning of the baselining. Um, out of that work, we identified some target priority areas that fed into the bigger picture roadmap that we put together about how we needed to execute and what the priority areas were because we hadn't managed data commonly as an organizational asset. You know, if you picture a state government, we're a $19 billion organization with 30,000 employees, um, and every agency prior to Governor Ritter's administration had its own chief information officer, own way of capturing data, storing data, maintaining da data, its own set of policies and processes. Um, so certainly there was a lot of work to do, but we needed to be very surgical about how we went about accomplishing a mission, and, and so we put together a series of priority needs for, for the state organization and, and tied it to what I called four anchor projects, which were high priority um, statewide initiatives, um, education, juvenile justice, healthcare, um, and transportation, and um, brought common groups together to actually start tack tackling the common challenges that they were each facing, but in a common way. Okay, so now it's 2009, right? Uh, so this started in 2008, if I heard started that right. Started in 2008. Two thousand nine. Of course, the world was dominated, uh, the uh, entire discourse in every corner of the world was dominated by the financial crisis. It what was. effect did that have on your ability to execute? Well, so we had to cut 20% of state budget at the same time, right. and we were also undergoing an IT consolidation. So sort of the backdrop to me becoming the chief data officer was one of the first things the governor did coming in was to centralize IT under the governor's office of information technology. The state IT had never, state IT as a corporate service had not existed before. Um, again, each agency had its own CIO, its own budget, its own um, pers IT personnel, et cetera. Um, but we were going to a centralized service model. So that was going on and there were a lot of changes um, that were happening in the midst of 
financial crisis overlay and the fact that we also had to lay off 20% of staff but still supporting all the services that need to be needed to be done. So for example, um, unemployment rates just shot through the roof and there were major, major pieces of work that needed to be tackled um, around the state's unemployment system, which was actually implemented in 1969, so right? Critical so, so Neil Armstrong walked on the moon when <laughs> this system got in <laughs> and the state, you know, written in lines of COBOL and the state legislators couldn't understand why we couldn't just, yeah. you know, <laughs> make some gooey change <laughs> and, yeah, right. and all of a sudden be able to handle, you know, the 600,000 more new applicants that we were dealing with. So th there were a lot of dynamics going on at the same time that we were trying to do data governance and improve data management and pull together a cross-functional governance body and actually implement, again, specific projects. So targets. the IT folks were migrating <laughs> the the, the unemployment system. They weren't migrating it, by the way. Uh, they okay. built a web front end on top of it, yeah, but it didn't get good, migrated. Good, because it never would have got for, done. For all I know, it's still operating well, it's probably, in the 1960s. Well, I mean it, it probably yeah. would have never got done if they had to it freeze the code and migrate it. Exactly. Probably because they couldn't have free of frozen the code. And yeah. No, I mean, it was taking the whole thing under. It was one of those wow. situations where you all of a sudden had to deal with this tremendous spike in service, but still support constituent needs. Now, you... Where, where did you fit in the organization? Within IT or? So I reported directly to the chief information officer, okay. um, which I generally rec don't, rec don't um, recommend. It's been um, a consensus here that that yeah. is not the best. I want to talk about, yeah. but, but go ahead. Uh, so, well, I'll talk about the plus and minuses. And generally speaking, because the data um, needs of an organization are really business driven. Um, the, the decision rights, the accountabilities, the, the business processes, all of those things really are business owned decisions. And so fundamentally, I really believe the chief data officer should be on the business side of the house somewhere. Um, in, in the case of state governments though, from a, a structural perspective, typically, you know, you don't have a CEO and you don't have a chief operating officer typically. So it's a different sort of organization structure um, because the governor was consolidating IT and moved us into the governor's office, we were sort of neutral Switzerland, right? The only other places to put a chief data officer would, would have been into one of the executive branch agencies, which would have pissed off every other executive yeah, yeah, branch yeah, right. agency, right? So we were only the, yeah, the only neutral had place. A, you know, an inherent advantage here. You know, exactly. Advantage, exactly. Right. So um, in that case, um, because of the organization structure, it worked out fine, but generally speaking, um, I, I truly support a really tight alliance between the chief data officer and the chief information officer or chief technology officer because truly the technology needs to be supporting the business and can support the business, whether it's through analytics or, or enterprise architecture, there's so many ways, but um, mm -hmm. the data requirements need to be driven from the business side. Okay, so talk about the outcomes of all that effort. So now you're you know, slowly coming out of the recession in 2010. You've got, you know. Well, sort of the rest of the country was slowly coming out like of the recession. Colorado, but right. State governments are, are now just now coming out. Yeah, I was just saying, it's 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 the tech boom was 2010, but that didn't ripple through. Yeah, I mean, if you think about government day. organizations, they, they tend to lag behind. Yeah, so they're absolutely. just now actually starting to get the revenue. Yeah, increases. 2010 was maybe, okay, there's, there, it, this might actually end at some point. Right. Uh, but, it but looks like but it's not getting worse. That was sort of the state exactly. of 2010. Exactly, so it was starting to stabilize, right. but certainly state coffers weren't increasing and we weren't adding headcount right. to what we were doing. Um, but what we had done was set up a very small, dynamic, what I considered a highly functional team. Um, it was myself. We had a chief enterprise uh, data architect, um, a business analyst, and a project manager. And we had, again, identified these four major cross-functional initiatives um, that were actually getting funding from the federal government. Um, so we had money coming in to do these things, and so we were able to actually continue our work with funding streams that were continuing. So that was actually extremely valuable for the state. And so what we did was partner with each of these initiatives and, and had them build money in to support the work that our office was overseeing and doing. Um, and that included everything from hiring business analysts for the projects to inventory the systems and applications and data sets relevant to those projects because we didn't have an enterprise data inventory for the state. We didn't have an app enterprise application inventory. So there were some baseline foundational things that needed to be done that we started with these four initiatives and started to fill in 
the gaps. And over time, hopefully that those gaps have been closed and they've got a better sense from an organizational view, what data they have, how that ties to business process, business function, et cetera. Now, when did you leave the state? Um, we had a gubernatorial transition at the beginning of 2011. Governor Ritter did not run for re-election. Right. Yep. Um, and so I left at the end of January of 2011 okay. and just went into private consulting practice. So what, what impacts were you able to see or were you able to I mean, measure uh, at that point in time? Started in 2008, exited in, you said, the beginning of 2011 or end of 2011? The beginning of 2011, okay. January 2011. What impacts did you... Um, th there were a number, number of things. So first of all, we did end up with four laws around enterprise information management mm -hmm. and information sharing. Uh, we ended up with uh, quite a number of enterprise policies and processes to begin um, our sort of repository of artifacts around data governance and started to align the way the various uh, divisions were actually managing their data. Um, one of the biggest wins was we ended up getting a $17 million grant from U.S. Department of Education um, to build our state longitudinal data system in the education space, um, which never would have been built without that grant funding. Um, but one of, the, one of the things that stood out to the U.S. Department of Ed was how our data governance process was being managed within the state um, that made us one of the early winners in the race to the top grants. Okay, um, now you had a legislative edict in the state of Colorado. We did, for highly supported by the legislature and the governor. So that was yeah. the catalyst for the role of the, the chief data officer. Now you, you, you joined the Federal Reserve. What was the, what was the, the driver there for, for them to say, hey, we need a CDO? So uh, with the backdrop of the financial crisis in mind, um, a couple of years ago, the Fed engaged McKinsey Consulting to come in and start doing some Help, helping support strategic planning mm -hmm. for the organization. Um, I think, think there was a realization that while the Fed is obviously an extremely effective organization, um, they've traditionally managed the research um, and the supervisor and regulation sides of the, of the business very separately um, and, and hadn't un until that point quite seen the interconnectedness of, of where, th where the two intersect, which um, may or may not have caused the financial crisis. I'm not going to get into that. Certainly, I don't know that. But um, out, out of the planning was an, an identification of um, the need to share more information across um, organizational silos and to be able to m better manage data as an organizational asset. Um, and so if you look at the strategic framework that um, the Federal Reserve Board has, its number one priority is financial stability, and its number two priority is uh, better data management and data governance. Um, and um, part of the series of objectives that fits into strategic element number two is the creation of the Office of the Chief Data Officer. So um, I joined the Fed on May the 20th, and that's when officially the Office of the Chief Data Officer um, got launched. And that was an independent decision, obviously, that the Fed made, right? And said, okay, this is a good idea. We need to do this. The executives of the Fed said, all right, we want to do this. We approve it. Let's do it. So that there wasn't obviously the same kind of legislative edict. So the question I have is, because we heard today only, let's see, one in 10 organizations have a board approved data strategy. And even probably less than that have a chief data officer. It's got to be, you know, low single digits, maybe. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. And maybe there's, you know, some kind of de facto data officer. But, but, but generally speaking, if there's not uh, a, an edict, um, there's maybe less of, a, of an incentive or a less likelihood, lower probability that you'll see a chief data officer. Or do you subscribe to the scenario that because organizations are trying to be more data driven, that a data czar, a chief data officer is going to be fundamental and organizations are going to see this. How do you think that'll shake out in the short run? I think over time, organizations that really are um, information heavy um, to, the, to their business um, will begin to have the chief data officer role more and more. Um, I certainly think that the best way to set it up is to have the executive sponsor and authority of your chief executive officer, your board of directors, the C-suite. They, they absolutely need to be behind that role in order for that role to succeed. Um, uh, part and parcel of that is a, a change in organization culture that enables um, uh, folks to get out of the mindset of the data is mine, the data is mine, and really view data as an enterprise asset um, and be incentivized to manage it that way. Yeah, so um, 
what should the chief data officer, what should be the scope? I, I don't like the word own, but <laughs> you know what I mean by that, not own, but what should be the, the sphere of responsibility for this chief data officer? I don't know if you saw Mario's uh, discussion today. He's on one of the uh, uh, panels um, with uh, Derek Strauss. Yeah, the first one this morning. Yeah, yeah. And I was amazed at the number of disciplines that he had up on that slide. There were 11 areas. There was like M&A, ops, data governance, policy, security, Mary yeah. is very talented. He can do a lot of stuff. So. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I almost felt as though, wow, that's uh, that's almost too ambitious. Now, of course, he's got a much smaller organization. Um, but what what areas of the organization should be under that umbrella of the chief data uh, officer? Um, I, I think part of that answer is that it's going to depend on the organization, mm -hmm. right, and what's what's needed. And I've been in organizations where they have owned as much as what Mario showed, which is really sort of the, the Dimbach model, right? The <laughs> everything from data governance through data architecture yeah. to, to business intelligence and analytics. Right. Um, in some organizations, data acquisition is part of that, depending on whether or not um, organizations are looking for content externally or not looking for content externally. Um, in some organizations, the BIC is really a really big part of that, right? The Business Intelligence Competency Center. Mm. Some organizations don't have that. Um, I guess my view of the world is that generally speaking, the, the chief data officer, first of all, owns the enterprise data strategy, right, and um, works with the rest of the C-suite and, and key executives and stakeholders across the organization to understand how the data strategy is going to be in support of the enterprise business strategy and goals and missions, whether it's we want to increase revenue opportunities and be more innovative or if we're trying to reduce operational costs and, and improve operational efficiencies, right? And there's a, a range of things that can be done in there. Um, enterprise data governance and enterprise data management, I think, are really important core pieces of the chief data officer. Um, in particular, I think certainly organizations that are really going to undertake this need to set up an enterprise data governance council, whatever that's called, that has, you know, executive support, is very cross-functional in nature, and uh, is looking at you know, the systemic issues um, around data and really tackling policy process standards in a common way for the organization. Um, lastly, I think the, the really sort of big other role the chief data officer plays is as change agent for organizations. And um, I, again, that's everything from breaking down the traditional silos and getting people to think about the bigger enterprise needs while still managing the what's in it for me conversation. Um, to being the storyteller about why improved data management is, is the right thing to do in support of business goals and objectives. So there's this change agent role and evangelism role that I think the chief data officer has a, a really big um, voice in playing for the organization. Opportunity. Transformation and in innovation, if you can mm -hmm. get to that point, right? I think, yeah. I think chief data officers today are doing a lot of the block and tackling work because it's been an under, data ha while Lots of people in organizations say data is the most important asset of the organization. The time and money hasn't been invested um, in managing data. Yeah, and the, da in, and in the data role has been so pushed to a, a back office role in many organizations. Um, right? In many organizations. And so I think for chief data officers coming in, it's, it's very much a startup um, shop, and a lot of foundational work needs to be done. Um, we heard it this morning. Just even having an inventory of all your data assets, most organizations don't have that, mm -hmm. right? So getting that baseline is really foundational in terms of understanding how your information flows are having, happening, what systems are interconnected to what systems, um, dealing with data quality issues, dealing with metadata issues, the whole, whole realm of things. You know, you can't manage your data if you don't know what data you have. You can't secure it if it's invisible to you from, from a security officer perspective, and you can't optimize it and leverage it if you don't know it's there. So. Um, we've talked sort of indirectly about this, but I want to ask specifically how social data fits and, and how you see uh, CDOs leveraging social data. I know, again, as a good consultant, good former consultant, <laughs> it does depend. It um, does depend. But, but, but we haven't talked directly about that today, um, social data specifically. What do, you, what do you see there? I think there are really specific interesting use cases um, that certainly are happening today, right? The NSA is a perfect example mm -hmm. of, the, you know, they're following our, our phone calls, they're following us on social media. They're, they're 
connecting those dots, right? Interesting and to follow the opinions on that, too. They, yeah. they, they fall on both sides of the aisle, don't they? They fall on both sides <laughs> of the aisle. And certainly the Intel community is doing a much better job of connecting the dots. And, and they are following right. social media and looking for patterns and analytics. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, you know, I think healthcare organizations are even looking at social media feeds and how to incorporate that as part of their um, 360 member profiling or, or member consumer engagement and outreach and, and how can we um, reach out and, and connect with our customers and our members or, and our potential clients in a more inf effective way than we've been able to in the past. Retailers are a great example of this, right? Um, of how they're leveraging social media to you know, send you a coupon or let you know that there's been a product announcement. But I think there's a lot of big opportunities again, to pull that into other big data analytics, um, to understanding where things are trending and, and be able to tie that into a broader suite of analytical services mm. that an organization has. All right, Mr. Lee, my last question is um, advice for, for young people. Um, I'm always telling my kids, get into some kind of data field, and uh, which means they probably won't, but because I'm advising them that. <laughs> but, but what advice would you give to you know, kids in college? Uh, they, they're interested in, in data. Uh, they're, I they're interested in, in this field. Maybe even you know, aspire uh, to be a data czar at some point in time. What would you advise them? Um, a couple things, and, and actually, if you heard Dr. Michael Rappa yesterday, I think he's got a really mm -hmm. nice approach to how he runs his program down well, at NC State. We didn't hear him, but State. he was on the Cube, and we're yeah. actually going to do some stuff with him. So you like should, he's great. Yeah. Um, but he takes a really holistic approach, because um, if you don't have the strategic thinking skills and you don't have the communication and marketing skills, then what you've got is a really great data analyst or data programmer. Um, but, but someone who can't communicate the value and tell the story to the organization about how the data is improving X, Y, or Z, right? And, and at the end of the day, that data has got to have some impact and, and value to the business. And so having um, uh, folks who have some technical skills, but more importantly, are able to think strategically, understand the business, understand what's driving the business, um, and have those excellent communication skills so they can sell the story and even know how to tell the story to sell, right? Wh why does this data matter to us as an organization? Mm -hmm. Why is it important? Um, th those are the kinds of future data leaders I think we're going to need in the future. Um, and hopefully the business schools and, and um, masters in science programs and engineering programs and mathematics programs are are beginning to get that message. That and so I was going to say, yes. what should my major be? Should I be a marketing major, a psychology major? Or I, mean, no, I, was, I was a marketing major right. undergrad okay. and then got my MBA. So I'm not a hardcore programmer, um, but I am someone that spent a lot of time on the business side of the house and, and leveraging technology to improve business outcome and leveraging data to improve business outcome um, uh, and be able to, to tell that story in a successful way to an organization. I, I, you know, I said last question, I want to ask one more. Thinking back on your experience uh, the state of Colorado, if you had to do it over again in thinking about maybe some of the mistakes you made, what would you do differently? My, my biggest, um, one, one of the things I say is, is the biggest thing I did not do well in Colorado, um, and I partially blame it on budget cuts and partially on being understaffed, was I did not communicate the value as well to the middle and lower levels mm -hmm. of the organization legislators, governors, executives across all of the division areas, all bought in, they all got it, they all understood it. But where things started to fall apart and when things did stall out um, in certain areas, it was always at that middle layer. Um, and we didn't have a great communication strategy and plan because we were just trying to execute and yeah. get, uh, get a lot done. Um, and so in this role, um, we will have a dedicated communications person and a dedicated training and education person and a dedicated change management person as part of our program management office so that as we are developing enterprise standards, policies, procedures, et cetera, we've got dedicated people who can work across the various functional areas to communicate, to build awareness, to build the, um, the, the knowledge and skills to actually do the implementation to sell the what's in it for me story mm -hmm. that needs to be told over and over and over and over again. Top, top to bottom, as we heard, top, to top bottom. down, bottoms up. 
Micheline, thanks very much. You're, you're, you're cool and smart, and really appreciate you coming on, sharing your great knowledge about the, uh, the CDO role. It's a, a great cap to, to an awesome two days here, so really appreciate your time. Thank you, Dave. All right, keep right there, everybody. I, I was just talking about smart. I've been at MIT for two days. I just feel smarter hanging out here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, keep it right there. I'll be back to wrap. Uh, this is theCUBE, SiliconANGLE's coverage from MIT's Information Quality Symposium. We'll be right back. <laughs>